with Suvet Matthews with ITS Partners. I'm here today with Patricia Adams and we're here to talk to you about 10 mistakes not to make when implementing your ITM and SAM programs. So let's get started. Hi everybody, good morning. This is Patricia Adams. Thank you for uh, having me join you on this uh, webinar of that. Um, you know, we were talking and brainstorming about what were the things that customers needed to know about asset management. And that's how we came on this idea of focusing on the top 10 mistakes. So in my experience, when customers have unsuccessful asset management programs or they fail and need to be re restarted, it's because of governance. Um, they haven't done the foundational work that needs to be done around governance to ensure the success of the program. And by this, I mean they've documented that they have a problem. You know, they know that they've experienced a large number of audits or they know that they're missing hardware and their loss theft ratios are very high. You know, it's easy to figure out what the problems are, but figuring out the way to get C-level attention is more difficult and more complex. So usually what you want to do is build your tactical roadmap, but your strategic roadmap should align with what your C-level's problems are that they're trying to solve. Now, well, you might find that um, rolling out a new ERP solution or um, putting more applications in the cloud or a comprehensive mobile device strategy or digital business and digital transformation are high on your C-levels. Uh, executives or goals. And by C-level, I should clarify, I, I mean CEO, CIO, CTO, CFO, and most importantly, the Chief Security Officer. So you want to understand what their goals and objectives are for the coming year and how asset management can support them in achieving their goals. Then you also want to bring in your key stakeholders. And key stakeholders are going to be other domains within the organization. And I'm very clear to say within the organization and not just IT, because your stakeholders might actually be the business unit, your customers. So your traditional stakeholders, because asset management is a shared service, and crosses domains within the organization. Your key stakeholders are going to be IT service management, your security team, and uh, potentially your internal auditors could also be stakeholders, your enterprise architects or strategic planners because they're setting the direction on technology and technology adoption within the organization, your business units because in some cases the business units have their own IT budget that they can go out and spend so they need to understand how asset management can help them. And by not being a bottleneck, asset management can demonstrate value back to the business units. So what you want to do is when you understand what your C-level's objectives are, the stakeholders and what their objectives are as well, you want to identify a roadmap. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the problems are pretty clear and apparent. We're, we're great at finding problems, but finding solutions is trickier. So you want to make sure that the roadmap that you build supports not just the tactical problems, which is that upcoming audit, but also these different domains and these different executives and what their goals are. So it should be both a tactical and a strategic roadmap. And within that roadmap, you should also articulate timeframes, timeframes to support or deliver on those initiatives. So if it's going to take three months, um, for example, an enterprise architect, right? If they're making a decision about moving to Windows NT, 
uh, excuse me, when moving off of Windows NT or Windows 7 or Windows 8, depending on what you have rolled out there, and, and I highly recommend moving off of Windows NT since it's no longer supported. But if you're moving to Windows 10, your enterprise architects are going to be looking at the functionality in Windows 10. They're going to be assessing whether it's competitive or value changing to the organization. But then they also need to know usage information. They need to know how many end users are out there, what applications are tied into those operating systems that might not um, work if they're going to move to Windows 10. So understanding what they need to do to be more efficient and effective and the time frame to help them and then create deliverables that meet those objectives and the goals that those different uh, executives or stakeholders are going to have is foundational to getting that good governance done right. So mistake number one when organizations fail at an effective asset management program is not having good governance and support from senior management and from the key stakeholders. So I'll turn that over to you now, Yvette. Thanks, Patricia. That's fantastic. Now, if I go in the right direction, we can talk a little bit about process. Um, process is the next piece. Now, we're going to have a couple of poll questions that we're going to post for everyone who's attending the webinar today, and we'd love it if you could take the time to answer those. Um, there's going to be a couple around uh, your ITAM programs. We're just curious to know where people are at. So I'm going to start talking about poll or about our question number two which is not documenting your processes. We all love processes. We all know that we need them, but we don't all have them. One of the things I hear the most at my clients when I visit them is, yes, I have a process. Is it documented? Well, no, we just know how it works. So one of the things that we find is that by not documenting your processes, you can't reproduce the activities that are required in that process. So for example, if you have an acquisition process, everyone today might do it the same way because that's what they do, but once you start getting new people into your organization, if there's nothing documented, what's going to require those people to keep doing things the way that you've always done them? Training, maybe, but having a documented process is going to help. One of the other benefits to documenting your processes is being able to share them inside your team and outside of your team. One of the things that my clients find most often is that other people outside of IT or even in IT have no idea what the asset management team actually does or why they're asking for particular activities or asking them for particular data. By being able to share the processes with them, they begin to understand why they're being asked to do certain activities or why they're being asked to share certain things because it's a requirement for the process. And without document, documenting your processes, you don't have a baseline to work from, to make improvements. Um, you don't know if things are working well if you don't do things the same way every time. So I encourage everyone to document their processes and then create a baseline metric from those processes to see how well those processes are working within your group. And just remember, you have to document or it's not really a process, it's just a suggestion. What was that, Patricia? So, I, you know, I just saw in the poll there, Yvette, that 54% said uh, that they already have an asset management program in place. So if they do have a program and they don't have the baseline, is it okay to start that baseline at any point in time or is it too late for them now? You should always start your baseline somewhere. Sometimes I call it drawing a line in the sand. You have to start somewhere and if you've had a program, even if it's been in place for 10 years, it's a, if you've never done any measurements, it's a great time to do a measurement because there's always room for improvement. So why not start today with that baseline measurement? Exactly. I, I agree with you on that. Well, I'm going to pass it over to you, Patricia. Okay. So, you know, we, we're talking about this idea of a baseline, right? Well, mistake number three is not putting in place metrics that measure effectiveness. So if you want to know how you're doing anything, you need to have some understanding of where you were, where you're going, and potentially 
how other people are doing in comparison, right? That's what we call benchmarks. So not having metrics in place, um, you know, you might have somebody that says, oh, I've got a great memory. Um, I don't know, need the metrics. I know how we performed in the last audit, but do you remember how you performed in the audit three years ago with that same vendor and, you know, with headcount constantly changing and a skill shortage in the asset management marketplace? It's important to make sure that you have that metric in place so that you can refer back to it. So if people leave the organization, um, if something changes, somebody gets promoted, or you don't have access to that data documented, you're not going to be able to understand where your opportunities are for continuous improvement. So here we've identified some financial base metrics, and these are metrics that are for companies that are, are starting out, and they're looking for an area of what they can measure. So fundamentally, time is money, right? Um, whenever it takes extended time frames to implement a new project, or to procure assets, or to negotiate with a vendor, there's a cost to the organization for that. Um, it might not be a hard dollar cost, it might be a sunk cost in overhead, in labor or resources, so we'll call it a soft dollar, but you still want to look at that, you still want to understand what that impact is. So some of the financial metrics that you could look at would be purchase price. So we all know when vendors are, are selling a product, you've got the list price, then you've got the negotiated price, then you have the discounted price. Um, there are some cases where I see vendors will discount something 80, 90 percent, and as asset managers or procurement professionals, we're really excited because we think we, we push them really hard to get that 90% discount, when in reality, the vendor probably overpriced their product to begin with. So understanding the nuances around discounting and purchase price are critical. Um, maintenance is another area that we look at. So most products, 18 to 22% maintenance. Uh, it depends what level of maintenance you have, what level of support. Um, when, whether the vendors are offering any additional services, um, maybe they're offering two-hour response time, or maybe they're offering like a quarterly health check uh, as an add-on. But you want to understand what you're getting for that maintenance. You also want to make sure you're utilizing that maintenance. Um, you want to make sure that the vendor is coming out with new patches upgrades, version releases, that they're continuing to innovate. Because if you're paying maintenance, by the time you reach that five-year mark on the product, you've basically paid for the product twice. It's the purchase price plus that maintenance. So you want to look closely at that and, and what you can measure around maintenance. You also want to look at your total cost of ownership. So many times when we look at TCO, we just focus on the front end of the TCO, like what it costs to purchase. But we're not calculating all of the changes, the training, the updates, the new applications that might be integrating in with it. There are a lot of things that go into TCO. So you want to look at your TCO, make sure you're also planning in that TCO measurement for retirement of the application or retirement of the hardware and the backing up of the data and the disposing of that. All of that should be built into understanding what your total cost of ownership is. Other areas that you want to look at as you're building out uh, these metrics um, has to do, I mentioned, with time frames and costs associated with those time frames. You also want to look at the value of your inventory. So if you have spare parts inventory or a workroom where you're storing new and unused assets. Look at the warranties that are in effect there. Make sure that you're deploying things quickly, that you're not overbuying just to store it on the shelf and have it get pushed to the 
deep, dark back recesses of the shelf and then uh, lose track of it because that warranty is costing you money. Um, you also want to have a good idea about asset depreciation. Um, is it on a two-year life cycle, three, five, seven, ten-year? Um, you want to build that into your TCO and your metrics that you're looking at too. And when you've got that in place, that can also help you forecast what your future spend is going to be. Because you're going to say, OK, we'll be using this laptop for three years, and we expect that the pricing is going to go newer models. And so if we're going to forecast our future spend, it could predictably be less than what your current spend is. Or you could say, we're going to move to different models or new applications, and we understand that there's going to be an additional cost to roll out those applications. So putting in place these measurements now, not just around the process that you mentioned, that, but also around these financial-based metrics, this ties into stuff that the CFO is concerned about, right? They're always keeping an eye on the budget and making sure that the IT budget is being spent effectively. And um, if you're moving to cloud or planning on moving to cloud, you want to make sure that that gets factored into this too as part of your metrics because probably within the next oh, seven to ten years, my guess is that 80% of the IT budget is going to be spent on cloud. And that's something that's really significant because that's going to drive change to what we're spending on data centers today and other areas like that. So make sure that you're looking at your metrics today of what your environment and start to forecast and look at futures for where your spending could be going ahead. Now, Patricia, one of the things my clients ask me a lot, and I'm not sure if yours do, but I'm assuming so, is putting metrics around the vendor performance themselves. Mm -hmm. So not just around your assets, but actually about that relationship with the vendor. Is that something you're going to recommend that they do at the startup of their program? So I think vendor performance scorecarding is something that everybody should be doing on a regular basis. And I think it's especially critical because when you look at the vendor's supply chain, right, they could have hiccups in their supply chain that might not affect you for like another four or five months, but you want to be aware of what's going to happen there. So yeah, I think vendor uh, performance metrics, whether they're delivering in the time frames that are specified, whether you're getting the discount specified, I think all of those are, are important to keep track of as well. Yes, absolutely. That's awesome. And I, by, by the way, I have a quote here at the bottom here. Um, mismeasurement can lead to mismanagement. I saw an article by Harvard Business Review that was talking about this very concept of how you want to make sure that you have the right metrics in place and the metrics that can evolve and grow with you and recognize that they will change over time as new technologies and new ways of doing business start to impact the IT organization. Fantastic. And you know, that's funny. That's a great segue to our next slide, um, which talks a little bit about things not fitting. Everything doesn't always fit together as one. There's not one process for everything. And when we talk about metrics, the metrics have to be customized just like your processes do. Um, we talk a lot about process in ITAM because it's the foundation of IT asset management. But we have to remember that our processes they should be standardized, but not completely inflexible. You're always going to have those situations where a process just isn't going to work for a part of your organization. Um, if you're in healthcare, it may be that your physicians need a different type of process for the acquisition of their assets or managing their assets. Same if you work for a law firm or you work in government. There may be certain individuals whose assets need to be taken care of differently. And you should be able to be flexible enough to create processes to work with them. Um, as your processes grow, they're living documents. They need to be adjusted based on whatever the new requirement is. Um, you should expect exceptions. Um, exceptions are going to happen. Uh, I always like to talk to my clients about their executives, because their executives are walking exceptions to most rules. Um, 
just documenting that there's a process available for them or even creating a separate process. Um, just making sure it's there so that everyone gets treated similarly who's in a similar function. Your VP and your CEO are going to expect certain things to happen when they ask for an asset. They're going to want the asset. Having a process in place to get that to them quickly with the software they need, et cetera, is important to maintaining that good relationship with those individuals, as well as your end users who also have expectations of being able to get what they need. The, the venue for getting that might be a little different, but it still needs to happen. Um, I see that having good processes should be akin to being an enabling function asset, shouldn't be a roadblock. So have, being able to provide information and be able to work with these exceptions is enabling them to perform more effectively and allowing you as the asset management team to be seen as a useful part of the organization as opposed to that roadblock that I hear from a lot of my clients that the organization sees them as. Patricia, have you had any experiences with um, clients where the process, they try to fill everything in through one process and it's failed? I have a few as well. Yeah, no, I mean, that that's absolutely right. Um, you know, sometimes they'll try and buy a standard template set of processes that might meet like 90% of organizations' needs, but you know, if they're decentralized or they have a lot of remote offices or remote locations or they're global, those processes aren't going to work for them. And even if you try to standardize within your organization to have a process, you might find that the process doesn't work over in France because of the way they buy there, or Russia, for example, because a lot of the technology acquisitions have to happen in country because of the tax revenue. So, you know, understanding that you put a process in place and that it's, it's not generic and that it needs to be evolved and reflect change, you're absolutely spot on on that, Yvette. Fantastic. It looks like another poll question has gone up, and it looks like 61% of the people attending today do have policies in place uh, around ITAM, so that's great. Um, that's something I like to hear and something I don't always see with my customers. Yeah, absolutely. So if we move to the next mistake, mis mistake number five, um, that's going to get us into these policies, right? We, we talked about how um, your processes aren't static and they're, they're not one size fits all. Well, the fifth mistake here is never revising policies. And I do see organizations do that because they're, they're really busy. They've got a lot of things um, happening, a lot of balls in the air, and um, focusing on updating and revisiting policies on an annual basis or even every two years, it can be difficult for organizations to find that bandwidth. But if you do have some type of business change, maybe it's a budget change or maybe it's a merger and acquisition or even a divestiture activity, you need to go back and look at those policies and make sure that they reflect your current business environment. And most often we put these policies in place and we forget that they need to apply to not just our employees, but also any contractors that we might be hiring. Um, when we build these policies, you know, we're very good talking about software asset management downloads and we talk about loss and theft of the um, asset, but we don't make sure that the policies are tying our security team's goals are. So um, ensuring that the policy also aligns with the security team and that you're getting their feedback and input is um, critical too. And then make sure anytime you make changes to these policies that you put a date on it, that you notify people, you make sure that they understand what the policy means. Um, you know, at my last job I had been there for 21 years and, you know, when I first joined, the HR policy manual was like 10 pages long. When I joined Landesk, the HR policy manual was 75 pages long. So you want to make sure that those important policies are not buried there and that you do annual training and update 
And if you're in a regulated industry, maybe healthcare, financial services, um, if you've got some type of government regulations that you're subjected to, you want to make sure users understand those policies. So having a little quiz where you ask them a few questions about it can ensure that they're understanding what that policy means and how it's going to impact them. This way, if you have any regulatory issues or impact, you can say, you know, these users have been trained on it, um, they answered the quiz. If they got the questions wrong in the quiz, then the manager should go and explain it to them. But make sure that the policies are updated, make sure that users understand it. You can get significant benefits from asset management just by having effective policies. One of the things I like to recommend is if um, an organization has some sort of computer-based training to try to get the asset management policies included with that annual training. That way it's kind of in front of everyone and you can actually see who's taking it as opposed to just assuming that they're doing it or reading them. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And computer-based training is a great way to have it recorded and digitized there so it's not something that's just signed off on. Absolutely. So, um, next thing. So now we have a policy, but mistake number six isn't is not socializing it. Um, you have to know what the policies are, and those computer-based trainings we talked about is a great way to socialize your policies. I actually absolutely love that idea. Um, I used it my last organization. It was fantastic. It got it out there for everyone. Um, if you don't have that avenue, you still need to communicate those policies within your organization in some fashion. It could be on your intranet page if it's a new policy. There could be links from your IT page, from your request portal, anywhere where people may have a chance to stop and they're going to interact with something that ITAM interacts with. Those policies could be easily uh, reached through a link there. Because we need to remember that not knowing the policies doesn't exempt people from following them. So if there's some sort of repercussion for purchasing an IT uh, item on a pro procurement card, you want to make sure that people know that that's a no-no. Um, you don't want someone to find out after they've already done something they shouldn't have done um, that leaves a bad taste in their mouth. So we have to make sure those policies are out there and they understand them. By communicating them, you get buy-in. If people understand there's a policy and then they understand why, they're going to follow it. Um, they're going to stop trying to find ways to go around it if they understand the value to the organization and how ultimately it will end up helping them. That's a great point, Yvette, because when I see people going around the policy, it's usually the IT folks that have admin rights, or if it's an IT company, you get developers that are like, you know, I, I have to have a special situation. My circumstances are different from everybody else, so, you know, these policies might not impact me. So, yeah, understanding that is, is important there. It's all about communication, and NIT tends to be the, the biggest violator of their own policies. <laughs> yeah, we love the IT organization. I, I, I love all my IT friends, but sometimes it's just understanding that we're not trying to keep them from doing their work. We're trying to make sure they're doing it in the best way possible for the health of the organization, not just for them. Yes, yep. So on to mistake number seven. Right, so mistake number seven is this idea that we're creating policies that only apply to end users. So an end user would be somebody that's in sales or in an administrative function. But these policies have to extend beyond just your immediate end users that we usually only think about. So they have to include IT. They have to include any third-party contractors that come in and do work for you. Um, I actually just saw a um, study yesterday where somebody said that they think that there's a huge security risk because a lot of their third-party contractors don't understand what their policies are. If you have any temporary workers, and this is relevant in healthcare, right? We there might be some areas where um, there is high demand, and you have to bring in some additional nursing help or um, other people to assist. Um, there's also in education. 
we see substitute teachers coming in or we see staff numbers drop off in the summer and some temporary workers coming in then, um, or suppliers, um, any vendors that you do business with, or service providers. If your asset management policies should be applicable to them, you want to make sure that that's documented and that they're aware of them. Um, usually when we're negotiating to buy product, we don't always think about having um, a policy that will affect that contract. So making sure that that's included um, as an addendum into the contract if that's uh, relevant to do so. But some of the policies that we should have in place are policies around acceptable use of an asset. You know, what's considered appropriate behavior with an asset. Um, another one would be around purchasing. So a lot of organizations, because they want to get volume pricing and purchasing discounts, uh, they will have centralized purchasing or centralized negotiation, but decentralized buying could be happening. So if that happens in your organization, you want to make sure that you do have a policy to indicate that. Um, definitely a policy around loss and theft of an asset. So if an asset is stolen from a car or left on an airplane, in fact, um, my last trip when I was coming home, I found an iPad sitting in the seat pocket in front of me. Um, even the flight attendants all use a lot of portable handheld devices. So if something gets lost or stolen, you want to make sure that they're filing a police report, that they're taking in in uh, to account the steps that they need, the due diligence to try and recover that asset. Um, also make sure that they understand how the policies impact their, the asset management processes because this will be critical to get them to follow the process and ensure that they adhere to it. Because if they're going to start to deviate, um, that's going to create data issues in other places, potentially in your tools. Um, you know, you're not going to have accurate data if too many people are deviating from the policy and from the process uh, that's associated with that. One of the best practices that I encourage my, my users to do when we're, we're on site is when we're talking about loss and theft, and the policy around that is to build a loss and theft process into the decommission piece of asset management. And one of the things that we like to do is it's not considered stolen or lost without a police report. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it goes into a status of just missing, which means some more investigation needs to be done. So with a police report, we can actually decommission that because we know it's not going to come back. Um, it's most likely right. just lost. But missing, that's a little more questionable. Right. Do you have a specified time frame on when they need to file that police report? It's typically as soon as they know it's missing. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if they've left it in the back seat of their car and their window's been broken or the car's been ransacked and their laptop right. bag's gone, we know that that's been stolen. If you were on vacation and you took your laptop and you may or may not have put it in the wrong spot in your bag, that's a little different. I expect you to look for it. But if it's actually stolen, it's stolen and it should be filed immediately. No point in right. waiting. No, it's, easy. it's faster to get you a replacement device as well then. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. That's a good idea. I usually see them use like four hours. They'll say if it's a window of four hours, then you need to file that police report. Yeah, um, I've had a couple of cases where I've had clients tell me that their users have said, oh, it was stolen, but they're not willing to file a police report, which makes me question whether or not it was mm, really stolen. Yeah, yep. So, so now we're on to tools, and we all love tools, um, quite a few. I noticed there a poll went up about tools, and it looks like we have 58% of our people today have an asset management tool already, so that's fantastic. So we have these tools, so now what do we do with them? Well, first thing we need to talk about is confusing, mistake number eight, confusing your asset repository with your configuration management database. Those are two different things. I wrote some definitions down to kind of help frame this conversation. Your asset repository is going to contain your physical, financial, and contractual data around your asset. So things to do with money. 
a CMDB is going to contain information about configuration items that are currently in use. So the difference between an asset and a CI is an asset has financial information. An asset can be a CI or it can just be an asset. For example, a contract is just an asset. It's not going to be a configuration item because there are no services per performed on that. Um, a software install, on the other hand, which sounds like it might be an asset, isn't. It's actually a configuration item because services are performed around it, but there are no financial data information around that software install. That's something that happens, but we need to know it's there so we can tie it back to a license, which is an asset. So assets are tracked from, as we like to say, dating to haunting. So from the thought that I might <laughs> want a thing to the fact that I've disposed of it and it could end up in a landfill, let's hope not, with our name on it, um, that's the haunting we talk about. Or the fact uh, we can talk about software licenses. I may have purchased Adobe Flash for Macromedia way back when and I've been upgrading it, upgrading it, upgrading it, it's changed companies. I need to know where my original purchase was and that's the haunting we're talking about. Someone, if I'm audited, I may need to know where that came from and did I have upgrade rights to it. CIs are going to be tracked while the asset is in use. So that's during your um, ITSM cycle, the install moves, adds, and change process. Those are where CIs are tracked, locations, the IP addresses, etc. All that information is tracked there. So we don't want to confuse those two, and your tool may use one database. It's just the fields in that database are going to be a little different. You'll have your asset-specific fields and then your fields for your CI, and both are useful. And if you're utilizing your asset tool within a help desk organization, both pieces of the CI information and the asset information are going to be very, very useful for your help desk in order to provide the best service to your, your users as possible. I like that haunting point there, though. That was uh, that was very funny because I certainly have seen a lot of companies from a disposal perspective uh, get hit with a haunting episode where things show up in thrift shops or in landfills where they shouldn't be because they haven't been properly recycled or anything like that. So, yeah, c completely concur with you on that one, Yvette. Well, my, my favorite client story is I had a client who disposed of assets and they didn't remove their asset tags from their assets, so their company name was on their asset tag. And someone was doing a documentary about landfills in China and they zoomed in on a monitor and it was my client's monitor in this landfill in China with their asset tag on it, with their name oh, on it. Right. It was that's something you definitely don't want to have happen. Never, never in a million years do you want that to happen. So, But I, I did actually hear, since you, you mentioned that, I did actually hear that there is a bill um, that's been proposed in Congress. Um, this is still in the proposal stage. But it was about when we retire assets that they cannot be sold to China because there's concerns about not data being on it, but the technology. So I have heard that that's up for proposal. I don't know where it stands, but it's, it's an interesting idea that now we're going to dictate where those assets can go or not go. You know, used to be that we donate them to charities, but now charities don't want the old stuff, so they have to be properly recycled. And we don't want all this e-waste sitting in landfills and contaminating it with gases and and uh, poisonous chemicals and things like that as as they're uh, decomposing, which you know takes two thousand plus years. So recycling them is definitely the way to go. Exactly. I, I'm, a, I'm a tree <laughs> hugger, so <laughs> that's my uh, my big thing is about making sure that we dispose of them properly. I completely agree. So um, let's talk about mistake number nine. So mistake number nine, when you're implementing an asset management program, uh, because asset management um, is that shared service and is collecting data from so many different sources, if it's going to be accurate, if it's going to be well-maintained, um, complete data sets that you're looking at, you need to make sure that your discovery information and your inventory tool 
is accurate as well. Now, many organizations don't re rely on one tool. They might have multiple tools. Um, there was one uh, study that I saw recently that said an organization had up to 40 different discovery sources. Now, that seems high. I would say the highest on average is probably seven to ten tools, but usually we rely on like two, three tools. So we've got one to discover our mobile devices, one for mainframe if that's in scope, one for Linux and Unix systems, one for Windows systems. Um, you know, sometimes the Windows, Linux, Unix, Macs might all be the same tool, but we need to make sure that if we're going to have good, clean, accurate data, in the asset system that that discovery tool that we're using is fit for purpose, right? That it's getting the level of detail that we need. So sometimes organizations will say, oh, I have this network monitoring tool. Let me try and leverage that. But it's not getting you the detail that you need around version level and patch level. Or they might say, I'm going to have, use this security tool, but the security tool is doing whitelisting and blacklisting of applications, and it's not able to say these five applications make a suite. They can just tell you what the executables or the DLLs are. So you need to make sure that your discovery data, your inventory data is accurate, and that the tool is fully deployed. So if you're going to use a client management tool, you want to make sure that your agent is fully deployed across your entire estate, not just on 90% of the assets, but across all of the assets that are in scope. So if mobile devices are in scope, networking devices, um, printers, monitors, you want to make sure that you're able to discover and collect that information. Um, for servers, if you're using an agentless discovery tool, you need to make sure that you know the, the um, IP range of the servers, which you know, it would seem surprising, but some organizations do not know the IP range. And then you also have to make sure that you have credential level access in order to run that discovery. Now, if you have assets that are not on your network yet, so they're not uh, automatically detected, you might want to use something like a barcode scanner or an RFID, radio frequency ID tags, or even sensors to collect the information and just know that the asset is where it's supposed to be, whether it's on a uh, warehouse shelf or whether it's about to be deployed. Um, and this gets tricky as we start to move into more IoT type devices that you can't install an agent on, but you need to know that it's out there and you need to know that it's still on the network, that it's still working, that it's still delivering as part of a business service. So have a process in place for tracking all of the assets that might be a manual process because they're not network detached, then de decide how you're going to track those assets. A lot of organizations will say, oh, we're going to track by user or we're going to track by location. Um, make sure you have a clear idea of how you're going to track them. Sometimes you might need to track them by multiple different methods, not just by user, but um, maybe by cost center. If it's a shared use asset, um, maybe at a credit card company, you're not going to be able to track that by user because you might have three different users in a 24-hour time frame. At an airline, uh, I mentioned those devices that they use on board to do your credit card processing. Um, those are shared use devices as well. So you want to make sure that you have a good process depending on what type of asset it is and then what level of data that you need to collect. So if your discovery tool, if it's one or multiple discovery tools, you need to make sure that it can collect the information with the detail that you need in order to do effective asset management. Now you talked a little bit about using like security tools or, or network discovery tools and, and they may not be fit for purpose, which I completely agree with, but what do you think about using those tools to augment some of the asset data? Maybe provide information that wasn't there before. For example, maybe the last time your security software saw a particular device. Or 
things that agentless discovery, maybe your network uh, tool can get beyond the firewall and maybe your other discovery tools can't. Um, what do you think about using those tools for those kind of activities? So supplementing the data where you have holes absolutely makes sense. But then I see organizations getting into this political struggle saying, well, we have this security tool, and the security tool can give us 40% of the data. And then you end up getting to mistake number 10 that you're going to talk about. So really, the, the key is to make sure that you're getting the information that you need from that tool. If you're not getting the depth, or there's a different user that might want that information or access to that information, you know, be aware, should that go into your asset management database, or should that go someplace else, maybe into the CMDB or, or another uh, database, maybe a configuration management system or maybe a performance management tool instead of an asset system. And thanks for your segue, Patricia, because <laughs> our last mistake number 10 is never normalizing your data. Now we may have multiple discovery tools and we ha may have multiple other tools that aren't discovery that are feeding into our asset management system. And the biggest mistake I see people having is they don't normalize their data. Basic foundational data such as users, departments, and locations can get really, really dirty if you're bringing in that information from multiple systems. So one of the things I always recommend is to normalize that foundational data first. So ensuring that your users aren't duplicated in your system. Um, they're not pulling in user data from your discovery tool and from, say, Active Directory or some HR system. We want to try to make sure our user data stays accurate as well as, as clean. Additionally, department seems to be one of my favorite eight different names of the exact same department. How do I run reporting on that information when I have that kind of mess in my asset repository? Locations is complicated, and I say it's complicated because different groups that set up different tools may have different definitions for locations. So it's not only a normalization exercise, it's actually an exercise in determining what your location hierarchies are. For asset data, the biggest problem I see for normalization is not normalizing on your models of your hardware and software. Um, having something very similarly named um, or creating a different model for every version, that gets kind of complicated. It's a good idea to ensure that whatever your tool is that's populating your database does actually do some normalization of that data. We want to know what the software is, what the versioning is, we want to know what the hardware is, and know the appropriate name for that hardware. Um, based on the, the poll question that went up on whether or not people are performing data normalization, 46% of our users are. The rest either aren't or aren't sure if their organizations are doing any sort of data normalization. Patricia, do you have any best practices that you recommend around data normalization? Well, I would say that data normalization is fundamental, right? Just the way discovery is foundational. Uh, you know, if the data isn't clean, it's not going to be trusted, and then people aren't going to follow the process or support, um, you know, the metrics that go into that as well. So if data isn't normalized, you could end up with huge amounts of data, um, and trying to make sense of it just becomes absolutely impossible. So I agree, normalization, reconciliation, understanding different naming conventions for the same application, or like the device name, some organizations might change the device name of if a device is in the data center and then gets taken out for a week or two and then put back in, they might change the device name and still use the same serial number. So yeah, there are all sorts of data normalization problems that are out there and I agree that this is something that could become a huge mistake if it's not done properly. And it looks like the majority of the people on who are um, on the webinar do not have a data normalization tool. So if they are doing it, probably a lot of them are doing it manually, which is a lot of work. Um, so we understand and feel your pain. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Because trying to normalize, uh, you know, if if I just think about my my own laptop, right? There are probably about five thousand CIs that could be tracked against that 
and you know that's a lot of work to have to do that manually. Absolutely, um, not something I ever look forward to, but will do if I have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, you've now heard our top ten mistakes. Um, we we enjoyed sharing these with you, and we hope everyone um, enjoyed listening in. Well. Yvette, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for uh, inviting me to do this webinar with you today. This was, a, this was a great one, and I think we hit a lot of the key points to help customers ensure that their asset management programs are successful by not making the mistakes that we outlined here. I agree, and um, I hope everybody had as much fun as we did, and we look forward to talking with you again soon. And if you need to reach us, you can see our Twitter handles are here. And feel free to reach out to us uh, via Twitter or directly to ITS Partners or to Landesk. So thank you all very much. Thanks, everyone.